Good morning, and thank you, everyone, for being here. We've got a great roundtable discussion about opportunities in franchising planned this morning. My name is Brooks Johnson. I'm a Star Tribune business reporter, and I'll be moderating the discussion today. I'd like now to introduce today's panel in no particular order, just how I have it on the sheet. We have with us the mayor of Minneapolis, Jacob Fry. Good morning. Good morning. We have Grace Waltz, Vice President of Public Policy for the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce. Tam Kennedy, owner and operator of seven Taco John's franchises and a partner with Performax Franchisee Advisors. Luke Carlson, CEO of Discover Strength. Courtney Henry, a local McDonald's franchise owner. Robbie Massey, a Great Clips franchisee uh, who has uh, several, I'm told, Great Clips franchises, including two downtown, right? You got it. Got it. Tom Schmitz, Director of Operations at Haza Foods, a Wendy's franchising company. Shelly O'Callaghan, Executive Vice President and the General Counsel at Dairy Queen. We have Brian Schnell, a partner at uh, Fagri Drinker Biddle & Wreath, who leads the firm's franchise and distribution practice. Dorothy Bridges, Interim CEO at the Metropolitan Economic Development Association, or MEDA. Tony Tolliver, Vice President of Engagement and External Relations at the Center for Economic Inclusion. And there's a few names I don't have, so raise your hand if I didn't introduce you. Can you introduce yourselves? And this is good practice because you're going to have to push this button to speak, and it turns red. Go ahead. Dustin Wetzel and Jimmy John's franchisee. I am not Bruce Newstead. I am uh, Will Hagen, Director of Government Relations for the Minnesota Retailers Association. I'll go next. Judy Jandro. I am a Senior Vice President at Community Reinvestment Fund. Wonderful. Thanks, everyone, so much. And a reminder, too, to turn off your microphone after you're done speaking. We can only have three on at once, so we don't uh, all overlap. And finally, let me introduce Matt Haller, President and CEO of the International Franchise Association. Who's going to get things started? Matt? All right. Thank you uh, so much. It's great to be here in the Twin Cities and in Minneapolis. Uh, Mayor Fry, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, IFA, the International Franchise Association, uh, we're a Washington, D.C.-based trade association, represent the franchising community. Our mission is to protect, enhance, and promote franchising as a business model. Uh, franchising in the United States has over 700,000 uh, U.S. locations, uh, eight and a half million direct jobs. We are 3.4% <clears throat> of private sector uh, GDP. And uh, the Open for Opportunity campaign, which has brought us here to the Twin Cities, uh, is really about telling the story of the franchise business model uh, and marrying it up with uh, really impactful data. Um, the data that has powered this campaign was uh, done uh, by an economic consulting firm called Oxford Economics uh, in September of 2021. Um, and it looked at a couple of different uh, areas of the franchise community um, and the franchise business model that are not, not fully uh, appreciated. Uh, number one, uh, with respect to the workforce, um, franchise businesses pay higher wages and offer um, higher um, benefit programs um, than non-franchise uh, businesses. Franchising is much more diverse uh, than other uh, sectors uh, of the economy. Um, we have 30.8% of our franchise businesses uh, are owned or operated by people of color. Um, and it's incredibly diverse in the types of businesses that use the franchise business model to grow. Um, people often associate, and we have some great restaurant companies around the table today, franchising with uh, the food service industry. And that is, of course, the largest sector, but it's only 40% of the franchise economy. Um, so hotels and personal service businesses, uh, commercial and residential services, uh, fitness concepts, and so many others uh, are part of the franchise economy. So a lot of what we're doing with this campaign is bringing those stories um, and those individuals to light. Um, and then lastly, the franchise model, it tends to overperform um, in downward uh, economic conditions. Obviously, the economy coming out of COVID is incredibly challenging, um, but we are experiencing uh, continued growth uh, in the franchise model, uh, both in terms of employment and adding new locations. So as uh, folks like Mayor Fry and other local officials are looking for businesses to bring to their communities, um, the franchise model is part of that solution. Um, just here in Minneapolis, um, st some statistics. Uh, there are 5,000 franchise locations approximately um, in the Twin Cities, uh, operated by 3,000 approximately franchise owners. Um, many owners, as we have here, are multi-unit, multi-location, even multi-concept uh, owners. And then, of course, some of our homegrown Minneapolis or St. Paul area uh, franchise brands uh, represented here, like Great Clips, uh, Self-Esteem Brands, Buffalo Wild Wings, Dairy Queen, and Great Clips. 
So um, with that, that's an overview um, of you know why we're here, what we're doing, and the discussion today. Um, now I want to introduce uh, Mayor Fry, uh, who of course has been an active leader uh, in Minneapolis for well over a decade uh, now, including your time on the city council. Um, now uh, leading uh, the efforts to revitalize and grow the city of Minneapolis. Um, you've done a couple of uh, Im really impactful things I think that you're gonna talk about here today, um, like the Commercial Property Development Fund, uh, as well as the Vibrant Downtown Storefronts Work Group. Um, and we're just honored to have you here with us today. Uh, I know your time is precious, so uh, I will turn it over to you to make some comments and then we will get into the discussion with the group. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Matt Holler, and thank you to the International Franchise Association. And welcome to Minneapolis. Welcome to the Twin Cities. We're really honored to have you here because we recognize how critical of a component uh, this business model is, both to our city in general, but especially to this recovery process. And as we recover right now from a global pandemic and economic downturn, the murder of George Floyd, the subsequent unrest, you know, we are looking not just to get back to the old normal, but to blow by that old normal to see true transformation in our city. One big important component of that transformation is ensuring that there is upward mobility, uh, that we have eliminated some of the roadblocks specifically to communities of color, to ownership that have previously existed. And at 30 plus percent uh, of the overall ownership model in franchises, we, we recognize that, that, that the franchises have been really beneficial to people looking to own their own business, to run with a great idea, uh, and to become you know, an entrepreneur and have a model and a boilerplate that is set up uh, and ready for them to take that step into the middle and, and even upper class. I mean, we, we recognize that as an important model uh, because it's worked uh, again and again and again. Uh, and, you know, there's also a familiarity, obviously, with a number of these important franchises that we've had in Minneapolis. Um, you know, I think several have been mentioned already, but, you know, Jimmy, Jan Jimmy John's, I, I, I go and I get the Italian night and I put the hot peppers on there. You know, I'm a, I'm a customer of, of Great Clips, uh, Dairy Queen. I used to get the Blueberry Blizzard, but they did away with the Blueberry Blizzards, and uh, which is really frustrating. You guys got to bring that back somehow. <laughs> uh, so just put, put in a word there. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, most every single one of the entities that has been mentioned, um, I personally have gone to people recognize uh, and there is some form of connection to, you know, and, th and that's due, you know, not just to some overarching corporate conglomerate structure. It's, it's due to the fact that so many of these are, in fact, locally owned. You know, it, it, you know, it is it is a model that has been beneficial in the past. It's a model that um, we want to make sure enables more and more communities of color, especially to take that next step into, you know, not just working at but owning uh, these important business models. And uh, I think we're going to get to this in a, in a little bit. So feel free to, to cut me off if we want to get to the, the questions. But um. Uh, we are making some really significant changes in the Twin Cities, in Minneapolis, as we recover. One of them that Matt briefly mentioned here is our Commercial Property Development Fund. Uh, it's the worst name in the world for a, for a really good idea. And, and what that good idea helps to ensure is that, is that uh, uh, communities of color, uh, low-income communities, and communities in certain districts throughout the city uh, cultural districts, green zones, ACP 50 areas uh, have the ability not just to own the business, but perhaps the underlying property as well. And there's benefit in that because then when there are gains in value to the real estate because of the sweat equity that they have put in and they've attracted more customers to the area, they don't get the boot because the rents got jacked through the roof, but rather they can make progress in the equity um, and the values increasing. And, you know, I, the word equity, you know, we, we often talk about it as kind of a, as a social justice thing, which, of course, it is. Um, but in the business sense, it's having the ability to make decisions around your business. It's to have a stake in the earnings when they come in. It's to, it's to benefit when the real estate values go up. Uh, and we want to make sure that that value, that asset, is as broadly dispersed and as inclusive as we can possibly have it in Minneapolis because we want to be a beacon for others to follow. 
We want to do things differently so that we set an example for other cities throughout the country, recognizing everything that we've been through in, in this 100 years in the making reckoning around racial justice. Uh, and, and we want to make sure all of you are part of that, you know, we, bringing people to the table, hearing their ideas out, because what I've recognized is that some of the best ideas that I've had um, uh, are, not, uh, are, are not my ideas at all. Uh, they've, they've, they've come from many of you. And we want to take those ideas in and make sure we utilize them. And, uh, and I, I really appreciate you all having this, this particular meeting and this conference here. Uh, as uh, you know, one of my, my best friends from college who I lived with in college, Ben Jenkins, he said, hey, you got to come to this. Uh, this is going to be an important one. And, and indeed, he was right. I'm already learning quite a bit. Uh, you know, I, this statistic around... You know, I believe it was you know 5,000 franchises in the city owned by 3,000 people is a really interesting one because what that shows is that more than half of them are uniquely owned. It's this is not like a, 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 this you know one f one owner one uh, franchisee or franchisor. Not sure how that works. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Schnell can tell me from from Fagri. Um but. Uh, what it means is that people are starting off and, and they're, they're running with some ambition. Uh, and it means that, that more than half of them are owned by a singular person, which I, I think is, is cuts against the grain of what a lot of people think. Um, and so it's an important statistic and I'm sure I'm going to learn a hell of a lot more. Yeah. Part of this is, uh, you know, perception versus reality with, with this campaign yep. and, you know, building relationships and, you know, getting the message out and connecting it with, you know, the real people who do own and operate, um, and build equity. Right. I think that's a really, um, important point. It's an important conversation point in franchising, um, around franchisee equity. And, you know, when franchising works, when franchisees are making money, Right? right, and franchisors can make money when franchisees are making money. And it's a really magical and powerful thing when it works. Um, so let's hear from some of the franchisees um, and I'll turn it back to you. Absolutely, thank you both. Thanks, Mayor, for those remarks. Uh, I'm gonna start directing questions uh, to members of a round table individually, but uh, feel free to jump in uh, you know, after that question's been answered. And well, there's a few of us up here, so we'll keep it kind of short if possible, uh, so we can get through a number of questions and touch on all the topics we're trying to get to today. Um, the mayor does have to depart at 9.30, so I'm gonna throw a question to him first, if you don't mind. Of course. Um, as you alluded to, Mayor Fry, uh, it's been an interesting few years uh, for small business owners and their employees uh, in Minneapolis and beyond. Um, you know, supply chain still not as resilient as we want. You know, we're still recovering financially from the pandemic, um, and then threats of a recession are looming. Um, how's the Minneapolis? How's the Minneapolis economy bearing? I mean, just big picture. How are we doing? And then, what are you doing to help? You know, and help the folks at the table here. Uh, it, it's a great question, Brooks, and thank you for being here. And thanks also for your contributions in terms of the media as well. It, it, it is very helpful. We. Um, you know, we're doing, we're doing well. I'm doing well. And for the first time in a couple of years, I'm not lying to myself when I say that. Um, uh, things are uh, uh, definitely coming back in a positive way. We are faring better of, of other cities of, of comparable size and scope. And uh, I, l oh, let me say this. There are areas where we are doing very well. There are areas where we're deficient. And I'll, I'll kind of go through both. Um, in terms of unemployment, we're doing better. Um, not just than any city in the country, but any city in the history of the country. Um, this, the state of Minnesota uh, just last year had numbers of unemployment which were literally the lowest in the history of the United States. Um, you don't get any better than that. But there is a converse as well, which is I'm sure many of you in this room are finding it, and I know I, as mayor of the city of Minneapolis, am definitely experiencing it. It's really hard to hire people. It's really hard to retain talented, awesome workers, um, and you know, from the city's perspective, we, it, you know, we we work through a union structure. It takes us a while to negotiate contracts. We we, we do it for one, we do it for all, kind of thing, and um, we aren't able to move as quickly as we'd like, um, and we definitely need to make sure that we're retaining these employees and workers in the Twin Cities. I think that is perhaps the most, the biggest concern that we have collectively is in human capital. 
Um, and so that's something that we're still working towards. You know, the, the other thing is, and I think we're finding this with this with the new generation, is we've got a, a generation of people that, that want to work but not be in work. Um, and it's, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not that old, but I'm, I might be old fashioned in this. I'm, I'm kind of a, you, you come into the office and you go to work and you get up in the morning and that's what you do. Um, and it's a transition that I think that we're all experiencing right now. And there are repercussions to small businesses, to franchises, to big businesses uh, that we're experiencing. And the, the area, other area where I feel that we're lacking right now is just the, that return to work. We are about average or slightly above average in terms of that return to work, but that doesn't make anybody feel any better because the skyways are just not as robust and happening as they used to be. Um, foot track traffic is not what it used to be downtown specifically. Um, again, we're seeing revitalization every day seems to improve. Uh, but the truth is, is that we've got a we've got a new model that I think we're probably going to have to lean into. This whole concept of remote or hybrid work was probably inevitable, but it got expedited by six to eight years by COVID-19. And commercial space is not occupied as much anymore. And I truthfully don't think we're going to get back to 100 percent. But I think we will get back to, say, 80 percent. What do we do with the remaining 20 percent? Do we convert it to residential to ensure that there's foot traffic that goes to the Dairy Queen, that goes to the Jimmy John's, that goes to the other small local businesses that we have throughout the city? Um, I think that's probably a recipe for success. Are we narrowing the square footage of each one of these individual retail spots at the ground level to perhaps attract a broader diversity of businesses? Um, so it's not just a sports authority and a Barnes and Noble, but maybe you got five or six or eight different businesses on the block. We have put together a task force on this exact topic. Would actually very much like your input on this as a body uh, because we're trying to figure out what is this model for the future. Truthfully, we don't know exactly, but I think it's going to be the cities that lean into the future and aren't clinging white knuckled to the past and what once was that see the best progress over the next several years. Thanks so much for that, Mayor. Um, I'm going to throw it to Tam Kennedy now. Um, Tam, as a uh, franchisee, you're a small local business owner by every measure. Um, what about your franchising story and your day-to-day -day operations uh, would you like Mayor Fry and other elected officials to know um, when they're working to support small businesses like yours? What's, uh, what's the agenda for them? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Welcome, everybody, for those of you that are um, from out of town, the IFA folks, open for opportunity. Thanks for putting this together for all of us. Uh, my story is actually one that I think um, you don't hear as much about in franchising, but is out there. And that is, I started as an employee, worked my way up, spent 15, 16 years working in the business, and then bought the company. So this is a path to small business ownership that I think most people need to start thinking about in terms of where those opportunities lies. And so we talk about what's happening in not just Minneapolis, but our fair neighbors over in St. Paul and all of the cities. We, we should think about the number one most important thing to small business right now, and, and that is our people. And where are those folks that we're going to need if we want to start reinvesting in some of these downtown areas? And I would suggest that we, I would like us all to think about if Head Start works really well for early education for young people, why can't we put together something for people entering the workforce that's a Head Start in terms of their career? Something that's accredited, something that is more than just a job, but it's earning them something more than just a paycheck, something that will move them forward into maybe business ownership, a path um, that they can follow. If it's, if it's not standard college, maybe it's college courses. Maybe some of the room and the space that we have down here can be learning centers and training centers, education centers that I think young people want. They want more than just a job. They want a future. They want to get to that future through their job. So I'd be interested in knowing if there's a way to partner with, you know, um, our NGO family out there, our certainly our local elected officials, and then our, our business owners in finding a way to put some people to work for more than just a job, but actually as a, a training ground for entrepreneurship. What do we think about that? Anyone want to pick that up and uh, continue on that path or answer that? 
I think that's a great, uh, great remark, and I think uh, the labor discussion is going to dominate today because, yeah. yeah, that's clearly what we're facing. Um, Robbie, let's go to you uh, because uh, this sort of segues well. There's so two of your great, uh, great clips locations are downtown Minneapolis, right? Yep. So there's a reason I brought that up. Um, it's an area that's faced some unique challenges, as we've talked about. Um, what are some of the challenges you specifically face, and what tools do you need to address them? Mayor Ferry, thank you. First off, um, you know I know the last two to three years have been beyond challenging for a lot of us, and I can't even imagine having your job. And I just want to say you've been doing a great job. Um, I know it's been super challenging with COVID and, and the riots and everything like that. So thank you for all, all you do and thank you for being here. Um, yeah, we do have 12 locations throughout the Twin Cities, uh, two downtown Minneapolis. And some of our challenges, as you mentioned earlier, is hiring and retaining good staff and even hiring enough staff to keep our salons open. And um, one of the main things we're hearing, the feedback from our stylists, is that they don't want to work downtown because they feel unsafe. And, um, and you know, there's been an increase in, in shootings and robberies, and our 46 and Nicholas salon has been broken into twice since COVID. Um, you know, back through with a, a truck one time to steal 57 cents from the register. Um, is there anything that we're doing to kind of try to make the downtown area a little bit more safer? And again, thank you so much for your time. Yeah. So yes, uh, first to answer Tam's, Tam's question, uh, absolutely we should work together on that for that, that staffing model, that, um, uh, that, that plan to kind of work together and coordinate on training. Um, and if you could just make sure to get a card from one of my staff that are here, uh, uh, Rebecca should be able to provide it before you leave. That'd be really helpful. Uh, second, um, Dravi, yes, uh, this is, I mean, look, I think there's two issues that we're focusing on from an overarching perspective in the city right now um, with a whole lot of subgroups beneath them. Safety, recovery. Safety, recovery. This is what I think about when I go to bed. This is what I think about when I wake up. <clears throat> and uh, we saw uh, some pretty significant upticks in crime and violent crime, not just downtown, but throughout the city and, frankly, the whole country and most every major city over the last uh, couple of years. I'm someone that listens to the data. Uh, there are some instances where the perception is of higher crime, but the data doesn't reflect that. The last two years, uh, both the perception and the data were, were high. Um, now, we have seen major progress over the last three to four months. Um, we installed an Office of Community Safety, which provides a comprehensive approach to public safety that's, that, that, that puts everything from fire to police to 911, emergency management, and violence prevention all under one roof, headed up by a commissioner. Of course, we hired a chief very recently um, who's also leading out uh, the police department and a pretty significant and robust recruiting effort. Uh, as you probably know, we've seen a lot of attrition in terms of our police over the last couple of years. Um, we need to bring police officers into our city. Uh, we need to get them hired up, trained in. They need to care about the city that they're serving. Uh, if possible, we want them to be from here, to have experiences here, volunteer here, so that they've got that embedded community service aspect from day one. Um, and while better does not mean good, better certainly does not mean where we want to be, things have gotten significantly better. Uh, we saw uh, about a 20% drop in violent crime in 2022. Uh, that 20% drop, the vast majority of it came over the last three or four months. So portions of those last three or four months, we were looking at a 40% drop, um, a 60 plus percent drop in carjackings over several of those months. Um, Things are trending in the right direction. We've added foot uh, beat officers um, to the, the corridors around downtown and a couple, uh, several of your locations anyway. Um, and I do believe that that presence has been helpful. The issue that I'll be transparent about is that it's not a sustainable model because we're basically just using a ton of overtime to do it. Uh, that's not good for accountability. It's not good for safety. It's not good for officer wellness. Uh, it's not good for none of it. Um, we would love your help in recruiting in uh, officers, 
just to enter the profession in general. Um, like I said, every city is going to experience this, and you know, it, it, it's always about money. You pay them more, of course, but it's about way more than that because we just don't have enough people that want to do this very difficult job right now. Uh, and so we're going to need to work together in, in bringing them in. Yeah. Um, we're going to switch it up a little bit. Uh, let's talk to uh, Courtney Henry. Um, so, uh, Courtney, you're a franchisee with one of the most recognizable brands in the world, easily, right? McDonald's. So, uh, how does the support of a name brand allow you as a local small business owner uh, better support communities in Minneapolis and St. Paul? What are some ways you can give back and show the positives of franchising? Well, again, thank you for being here, Mayor Fry, and thanks for having us. Um, you know, one thing being a local McDonald's owner operator, and I just wanted to give you some quick stats out of the nine. McDonald's in Minneapolis, seven are no owned by minorities, yep. which is which yep. is awesome. So we we're talking about how franchising can give minorities a, a role in ownership. And out of the all the McDonald's owner operators here in Minneapolis, I know we really give back to the community. We have Archways Opportunity Program where we put a lot of kids through college. You know, a lot of times they'll be the first person in their family to go through college through programs that we um, we have. We also talked about you know the. You mentioned the horrible murder, murder of George Floyd. You know, some of the things we did for our employees when everything was shut down, you know, all the grocery stores were shut down. You know, we teamed up with operators from Mankato from other parts of the country and just, you know, just uh, banded together. And we had people from Mankato driving in diapers and formula and stuff and giving back to our employees. You know, we set up 401ks for our employees. We also, you know, one thing that's passionate to me and my father, we both went to HBCU, Southern University, and I've been, we've been working for over 10 years um, exposing to, you know, young black kids throughout the that's Twin right. Cities, working with the church over in St. Paul. And we've personally sent over 50 um, kid through the metro area on historically black college tours and universities. So one thing we always try to give back, um, being with a brand as big as McDonald's is, you know, we're globally known and we're able to have uh, things through archways and other programs. We've done backpack giveaways. Um, and, you know, personally, one thing that we're really proud of, we've actually had people who have employees who have started with us as crew yeah. and were able to own their own McDonald's, That's you great. know. So, and I can't tell you how many times we have people come back to us and say, you know, Mr. Henry, you know, I worked for you when I was in high school and now I'm a doctor. Now yeah. I'm a, you know, a lawyer. So it's just, you know, some of the programs that we're able to do is just, you know, really good to be able to give back to the communities. And that's one thing, being local franchisees, that's not right. this big, right. you know, big corporate, you know, company, we're able to do that. That's right. So. Well, you, ha you have been given back and, and, and thank you, Mr. Henry. And, you know, I feel like I know. Uh, those franchise owners that you were mentioning personally, like every single one of them, you know, it's, 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 it's you, it's Mr. George, right? Uh, we've got a Baylor's. whole, yeah, Baylor, Tim Baylor. That's right. That's, it's Tim. That's right. Um, uh, there's a whole slew of them and it, it, ma it makes a big difference. A uh, similar question coming your way, uh, Shelley, uh, but from a corporate perspective, right? You know, as an iconic Minnesota brand, uh, Dairy Queen, probably the first place I ever had ice cream as a, as a child, frankly. Excellent. Uh, uh, what do you see as the best way franchisors, franchisees, and communities, political entities, leaders, uh, how can we all work together to ensure economic prosperity you know, sure. across Twin Cities? Sure. I mean, as a number of folks have already mentioned, you know, franchising as a model is really uniquely positioned to engage in a local community in a way that, you know, larger, um, larger entities and entities that own a lot of corporate locations maybe just aren't. Um, Really, you're looking at a small business owner who's local in the community, but they really have the backing of a much larger organization, right? They have the know-how, they have the resources, you know, and, and it's part of, as a franchisor, it's part of our obligation to ensure that we are doing our part to provide the resources um, and do the education um, sometimes that's necessary to make sure that people understand that initiatives like diversity, equity, and inclusion, talking about providing opportunities to people and communities, it's not just the right thing to do, it's very good for business. And sometimes that resonates very well with, um, with the local owners. Um, we as a company also have a very high percentage of single store and you know, just a couple store ownership. Um, very different than many of our competitors in the large QSR mm -hmm. space. People assume that we're a giant corporation. We're really not. We are almost 100% franchised. Of our 7,000 locations worldwide, we have two corporate-owned stores. Um, so we are all in on the franchising model. Um, the way we grew up as a brand, um, mostly in the Midwest and in the South, um, 
really um, encouraged independent ownership and family ownership. Mm -hmm. Today, a lot of those communities are changing, right? So the ch those communities don't look the same that, as they did, you know, maybe 10 or 20 years ago. And is part of our obligation to make sure that the owners that are in the local communities understand that it's important to be a reflection mm -hmm. of the community, both in your ownership, in your staffing, in the initiatives that you support, um, making sure that they get into those local areas. Um, as a franchisor entity, not just supporting the, the franchisees, um, it's important for us to make sure that our values and our mission statements align um, and that we're publicly seen um, to be supportive of those kinds of initiatives. Um, our mission statement for many years has been um, ensuring positive memories for all who touch DQ. Became much more um, important and really resonated well as we went through some of the travails that have um, happened yep. over the last yep. few years. The other thing that we do is we look, um, even as a corporate entity, into the communities um, that we are, have corporate offices in. So, for example, um, you were talking, Tam, about um, supporting sort of, you know, the, the building up of the um, teenagers and sort of first job. There's an organization in the, in the um, Twin Cities that I'll put a shout out to. It's called Cookie Cart. Does anybody know what Cookie Cart is? Um, it's one of our major... Um, um, Charities and we have board members on that on that board and and support that it is it is absolutely the definition of the grassroots um, You know building giving kids their first jobs moving them into management positions in bakeries um, Those sorts of things so finding those right ways to enter the community even as a franchisor um, Is also really important um, The other thing that we do is you know you look at ways to, you're talking about barriers to entry, you know, you talk about shrinking the footprint of some of the stores. You know, if you look at the, the um, locations we have in the suburbs, they're big, you know, they're, they're these, they're a full old QSR. You know, if you look at some of the, the locations more in the cities, we've got seven in Minneapolis, they're not as big, right? They're, they're smaller, but they're a little bit easier to enter. They're, as we look at developing new locations, it's also what we're doing is looking at smaller footprints, right? Again, so you don't, it, that it's it's in line with what our fans want, right? Which is nobody, not as many people are sitting down in a restaurant to eat anymore. Um, they're going through the drive-through, or they're getting it delivered, or they're coming to pick it up. And so, shrinking that footprint um, it provides service to our fans, but also provides a little bit of a less of a barrier to entry from a cost perspective. So, those are some of the things that I think we can do. Mayor Fry, I know you uh, are getting the hook here. So thank you so much for thank you so much, uh, your participation. Uh, the last point I'll leave with you, and you've heard it. Um, when you think about franchising, we like to say you go into business for yourself, but not by yourself. Um, so we're here to support you. Um, and our franchisors are here to support our franchisees um, with our great franchise supplier community. So again, thank you for being with us today and all you're doing to support the city and look forward to working together. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, yeah. everybody. Thank you, Matt. I really appreciate working with you all. Have a good one. All right, we're going to keep things moving and, and uh, kind of open it up to uh, a more general discussion. I'm, I'm hoping, Dorothy, you can talk about, um, you know, how small business ownership and franchising uh, is a tool in wealth building and upward mobility for Minnesotans and, and really sure. put a fine point on um, that. Yeah, let me preface my comments with a little bit of a context. Meet a... Metropolitan Economic Development Association has been around for about 50 years. And um, since 1971, we have focused all of our efforts on building uh, support for uh, BIPOC. Uh, it was then, uh, the terminology was minority entrepreneurs to help them succeed. And we do it in a number of different ways. We have a platform that consists of a three, three legs of a stool. Uh, and uh, the first leg is, of course, um, providing that consulting or technical assistance to uh, really get our entrepreneurs, would-be entrepreneurs, ready uh, in terms of owning a business and all that it takes uh, for ownership. And we provide connections. I mean, once they open the doors, they need assistance in terms of connecting to a network of corporations and others that would provide revenue, sources of revenue for them, contracting, for instance, or procurement. And then the third is capital. We have a loan fund. Uh, we have ability today of about 65 million, of which 23 is deployed, 23 million. Uh, and this is the biggest thing uh, where entrepreneurs uh, are, are landing when it thinks about owning a business, including franchises. 
uh, franchise operations uh, do provide the benefit of low barrier to entry in most cases. Uh, the biggest hurdle for our BIPOC community is capital and how do we drive capital and liquidity to those institutions to fail? Someone had, I think, Matt, you mentioned that you have 30% uh, uh, of your franchise owners uh, in uh, people of color. Um, I wonder how many people of color have owned but failed in a short period of time. I would say it might be at least twofold or maybe threefold. I'm not sure. This is anecdotal. But what we're learning is that uh, there is a need um, bootstrapping to go into franchises without the forethought of, of you know, long range and how do you want this to grow over the period of uh, a number of years and what is it at the end of the road that you're looking for. And I would suspect that they're looking for prosperity ways to create wealth, to uh, really um, um, give to their, their, their descendants. Um, and um, they're having a challenge doing that because they can't get to scale uh, from a revenue perspective, or they simply are not in a position to then uh, leverage and to add to that first store or that second store that they own. I think the Courtney uh, and the Tim Bailas of, of uh, the world are, are are unique in terms of their ability to really grow and, and prosper in the franchise world. Mita has uh, fa financed several franchises over our years, and, um, and those are the things that we're learning, the ability to build net worth and the opportunity to provide for liquidity so that they can operate their business successfully and to expand. Yeah, I mean, I would say um, we do not have a specific statistic on minority um, success or failure rate. Failure rate in franchising is particularly difficult uh, to measure. Um, what we do know is that franchises on the whole uh, drive 1.8 times higher um, sales than comparable non-franchise businesses, so a franchise restaurant versus an independent. Um, and they provide 2.3 times as many jobs um, as um, their non-franchise counterparts. Um, with respect to minority statistics, though, um, the black-owned franchises um, earn 2.2 times higher than non-franchise. So we have seen in that Oxford report, um, there's some demographic data that we were able to get to um, that do demonstrate a track record of sec success for um, different communities. Okay. Thank you. Uh, continuing, with, uh, continuing with this thread, uh, maybe, Tony, you can speak to this. What are... Um, how can the franchise industry, how can IFA, how can others in this room help address some of the challenges we've talked, the barriers to entry? Sure. So some of the work that we do at the Center for Economic Inclusion is look for ways to close the wealth and wage gaps. Um, and, and Dorothy mentioned some of the things that we have concerns about that we hope you take into consideration. Family sustaining wages is one. I know in the beginning when someone first gets a franchise, that might be tough. But we've seen wages come up uh, over the last few years, which has been a really good thing. Um, uh, ownership opportunity. Um, Dorothy also mentioned access to capital to making sure that folks who want to be owners, uh, who want to be small business owners, understand the opportunity with franchises, uh, businesses, and, and um, spreading the word about that. Equity amongst your uh, ownership is great. So, I think you said 30% uh, were owned uh, by minority folks. Uh, and uh, 5,000 businesses, I think there was the quote, uh, 3,000 owners here in Minnesota is a great uh, statistic. Uh, anything that uh, you can do to keep those that momentum across the country, um, making sure that the word is out about uh, the, the opportunity, uh, those are things that will certainly help uh, grow uh, the the numbers and, and help uh, build the awareness. And we're happy to be a partner in that space. And thank you for having us here today. Wonderful. Yeah, just a quick comment. And I was saying this to Dorothy before we started. One of the things that most franchisors are seeking are leads, qualified leads. And as they particularly seek uh, more diversity within their franchisee base, um, either through the IFA and our Diversity Institute, which is part of our foundation, or directly with some of our brands, um, building partnerships with community organizations uh, at the national level, um, as well as at the local level, to you know, take our subject matter expertise 
and the brands with the desire to grow and reach these communities for potential franchise ownership is really a big component of this Open for Opportunity campaign. Um, so we'd love to work with both uh, of your groups uh, to help uh, develop programs to reach audiences that you uh, may be able to reach. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, just a, a thought. Um, Mita is, um, has had some success over the last couple of years uh, with providing for our clients the opportunity to acquire. And I know the franchise, especially the corporate franchises, um, you have the opportunity on occasion when an owner uh, probably is trying to uh, exit and they have a franchise or a group of franchise stores uh, you seek or you are looking for. Maybe just broadening your aperture to include uh, opportunities through an organization like Mita for our clients to be uh, able to be on that list of um, acquirees, acquirers. acquirers. <laughs> so yeah, to give us the chance to allow for our entrepreneurs to uh, bid for those those franchises. That's a great idea. Yeah, the the resale and franchise transfer market is very um, very big right now. We were talking about that uh, just before the start of the program. Just really quick, Matt, will you share just a little bit more about our foundation and the Diversity Institute and some of the other um, IFA products that I think would really speak to the large part of the room? And I sit on the board of the foundation, but I'll leave it to Matt to give you all of the details. Thanks, Tam. Uh, happy to. So our IFA foundation uh, has four programs uh, that exist. Uh, one is the Diversity Institute, which I mentioned, um, helping connect uh, IFA brands with uh, communities of color. Uh, and build partnerships with organizations at the national and local level to reach uh, those communities and uh, address specific challenges uh, within them. As subgroups of that diversity institute, we've in the last several years formed uh, the Black Franchise Leadership Council, as well as a Hispanic Latino uh, Franchise Leadership Council, um, led by uh, franchisors, franchisees, and suppliers, um, so lenders and law firms and things like that that are um, involved in the franchise community. Um, second program is our VetFran program. Um, so that's that program is our longest uh, program in the foundation. It's existed uh, since the first Gulf War. Um, helping transitioning uh, military service men and women and military spouses um, into franchise ownership. Um, a lot of the similarities between the military and operating within a system and a structure. Uh, so we have 600 plus uh, franchise brands who offer discounts off initial franchise fees uh, to military veterans. Um, the third program is Franchising Gives Back. I know that's the one that Tam is particularly passionate about. Um, we talk about, you know, what brands and franchisees are doing to support local communities. Uh, Courtney touched on uh, some of what the charitable work. This, franchising is back is really about aggregating the stories um, and the contributions that the franchise community um, gives and reinforces the notion that franchising is indeed you know, locally owned and operated. So um, franchising gives back. And then uh, lastly um, is research. So what our foundation does is produce research. They produce this Oxford economics report that led to this, uh, this campaign uh, open for opportunity. So uh, thank you for the setup, Tam, on that uh, commercial. Um, let's talk about franchising, uh, right? That's why we're here, but like the actual process of it. Uh, Luke, Discover Strength, right? Uh, as an emerging fitness brand found, uh, founded right here in the Minneapolis area, one I'm familiar with, as you can tell by my physique. Uh, <laughs> why, why did you decide to franchise? And uh, what are some of the lessons you've learned so far on that journey? Thanks, Brooks. I found out Brooks was a client at one of our locations this morning. So um, <laughs> please get it when you get a chance. Compliment him on his uh, physique. Um, so you know we've always been passionate. We've operated stores for 17 years, and we got into franchising two years ago because we had a passion for one, developing exercise physiologists, developing exercise professionals, and two, developing leaders, managers, and entrepreneurs. We also knew that we had strong union economics, and this would be a great uh, entrepreneurial opportunity for um, for the right person. And so. Franchising has allowed us to live out those passions. We develop exercise physiologists and we develop entrepreneurs. Uh, our exercise physiology positions are among the highest paying uh, exercise uh, physiology positions anywhere in the country. And so we have partnerships with the University of Minnesota, with St. Thomas, with Augsburg College, with the local colleges and universities, and they're just not seeing employment opportunities like our franchisees are able to offer. So that's number one. And of course, um, the idea of 
taking those exercise physiologists and creating career paths for them where they can become leaders and managers, but they can become entrepreneurs themselves. That's a, a passion of ours as well. And we think we can provide uh, that leadership training, the business training, the management training that allows them to be uh, successful as an exercise professional, but as an entrepreneur, as a leader, as a manager. Uh, similar question coming uh, your way, Tom, uh, though you've had a little more experience. Uh, you've been with the Wendy's brand about 40 years now? Yeah, they consider me seasoned, but I <laughs> call myself old. <laughs> uh, well, congrats on a long and Thank successful you. career. Uh, what advice do you have for someone uh, just beginning their franchising journey, whether as a franchisor or as a franchisee? Sure. If I could just address a couple comments that were made um, by Borth, Dorothy and some of the folks that spoke before me. Um, as far as the number of franchisees that fail, what I, I Google now, I know you probably don't think I can use a computer. I Googled how many franchisees, first time franchisees uh, fail in the first year, it's 60%. Within five years, it's 80%. So any of the franchisees that are successful, you've done something right. Um, so you can congratulate yourself. The other thing um, is how do we recruit, you know, more people, because I heard there's four job openings for every one person that's looking for a job. Um, I think we have to get rid of that fast food stigma that we have. Similar to Minneapolis has a stigma that's dangerous. Um, what I look at it, as far as the stigma, I look at it as a stepping stone, not to get a better or real job, but to make a career out of it. Uh, I'm living proof that I was hired in 1981 as a manager trainee. Somebody, I was from Western Wisconsin, and I was just graduated from college. I didn't intern or anything like that. So who's going to hire a 22-year-old business major that has no experience? So someone said, you know, just move up to the cities, get a fast food job, and something will come to you. Well, I think for most of you that have been in the business, it gets in your blood. And it's one thing I was pretty good at. Um, so I, I stuck with it. And it's, you know, Wendy's has been very, very good to me. I, I've stuck with Wendy's for 40 years. I had the opportunity to have some encounters with Dave Thomas. Unfortunately, a lot of our employees nowadays don't even know who Dave Thomas is because he passed away in 2001. Uh, so some of the younger folks don't know him. Um, I was fortunate enough to work for two fabulous franchisees um, that were very humble, very generous with their money, reinvested in their properties. That's the way to do it. Um, I'm retired, but I remain a consultant. Um, but, you know, just the encounters with Dave Thomas. I've, I'm friends with Junior Bridgman. He's a, a minority owner. He was a former NBA player. He owned uh, stores in Milwaukee, Louisville, Florida. Very humble guy. I think he's an attorney by trade, to tell you the truth, after his NBA experience. So I've been fortunate enough to, to run into a lot of people like that. But um, so sorry, I didn't get to your question yet. Um, but that stigma, we got to get rid of that so that we can, people apply with us and know you can start a career here. Minneapolis, we have four restaurants. We have 52 locally. And in those four restaurants, I personally was involved with the promotion of those general managers uh, of minority, uh, two African Americans, two Hispanics. Um, I'm very proud of that. I spent time with them. Um, one of the things I would tell the first time franchisees, particularly in restaurants, is that they're not an absent owner. Many times my neighbors said, where's your office? Well, I'd always give them an address of a couple of Wendy's because that's where I was. I was in the dining rooms. That's where I made my office. So that's one of the points I would make to them. Um, and getting back to your, to your question, you know, maybe I've watched Shark Tank too many times, but you need to have a solid business plan. You know, short-term, long-term goals. Um, short term being how many people are we going to hire long term hey in 15 years you have to replace that roof that's going to cost seventy thousand um, dollars so I, I again I was fortunate to work from franchisees that put their money where their mouth is um, you have to surround yourself with the right people you have to surround yourself with attorneys with financial advisors um, with I'm not bragging or anything you you got to have an operator if you're a first-time franchisee, someone who's done it for many years. Um, I think too many times people come into money and they go, you know, I can, I want to open a restaurant. You know, it's not as easy as they think. It's a 24-7 job. Um, 
So, and building relationships with city officials, with vendors, with your internal customers, and that's what we call our employees, internal customers. You have to, if you treat them well, they're gonna treat your normal customers well. Dave Thomas left many legacies. One of them was just be nice. Be nice to your employees and they'll be nice. Take care of your business, your business will take care of you. Um, I think you have to automate as much as you can. And, and you know we've seen that through mobile ordering, through delivery options, things like that, because there, aren't, is, there isn't that labor pool we used to have. Um, protect your brand at all costs. Um, in particular, food safety. Um, you cannot, there's a reason our hamburgers are square at Wendy's. We don't cut corners, according to Dave. Um, so, you know, protect your brand because if you have a food outbreak, for instance, not only does that hurt your one particular restaurant, that kills your brand. And you know what? It hurts McDonald's. It hurts very quick. Is it safe to eat there even? Um, that kind of thing. So protect your brand. Uh, I mentioned don't be an absent owner. Know the laws and regulations. There's so many different regulations and laws out there. Sick and safe. It's different in cities, from city to city. Just monitoring, managing it. And you know, we've got 18 year old people managing and you're counting on that they're not gonna keep that 15 year old past seven o'clock. Um, the sick and safe, how, how do you monitor that? Minneapolis and St. Paul, you have, um, you can earn one hour for every 30 hours work. Well, in Duluth, it's one hour for every 50 hours. You can cap it at 48 hours in Minneapolis. You can cap it at 64 hours in Duluth. I mean, who's keeping track of all this stuff? That's why all those regulations is, you know, can drive you crazy at points. Um, and then I guess the last thing I would make sure that they stay relevant, whether it's your menu, um, keeping up your facilities, um, keeping up with technology for sure. So. Um, those are just some of the ways, some of the ideas I would give first time owners. I know I'm preaching to the crowd, but congratulations for the franchisees in, in, in the room here. Um, Brian, kind of similar thread here again, uh, you know, as a partner at Bakery Drinker, with a long history of working with franchisers, um, kind of similar question, you know, what, what works and what doesn't, you know, and what gets in the way, what's some of the low hanging fruit maybe you can go after to say like, this would make it easier for everyone. Uh, what are some of the long-term things folks got to keep an eye on, uh, policymakers and others, to just make it a better ride for everyone? What I'm so encouraged about this conversation is all the right people, you know, having the right commitments and conversations, and you know, how do we keep moving that forward? I think that'll be um, one of the challenges and. Personally, I, you know, the IFA, we have these quarter franchise business network quarterly meetings. Twin Cities has been a strong, Matt and I were talking earlier, franchise community for decades, but we've been a little dormant in some respects, right, Tam? You and I have talked about that. And so is this the opportunity to keep building on, on what we've started here and what all of you have shared? And I, personally, that's a commitment that I uh, um, am, going to make and hopefully we can make that happen um it, it's so tom hit on all the um key areas and in franchising it's those systems and brands that um are sustainable right it, it is easy and luke congrats you you guys have so many great foundational building blocks um and and so a lot of emerging franchisors don't get beyond emerging um, and so we've got lots of good examples of those that do, but that's a unique challenge. And, and so what it takes is a lot of what Tom alluded to, but it's having that um, evolve, that evolution, that commitment to customers and employees. And here's one of the challenges is, um, on, so we all know that our franchisees, one of their biggest concerns is employees, talent, right? How do I keep and find uh, employees. And then we have lawyers that are saying, well, you know, this whole joint employer area, you, you as a franchisor don't want to get too involved in your franchisees employee related matters. We got to solve that. Uh, and the IFA has done a great job on the legislative front fighting that. Um, there are a lot of lawyers fighting that, but how do we still find ways to help our franchisees with those employee related issues and some franchisors have said, hey, we're not, we can't just say no, we gotta find solutions. 
And so that's the challenge that I think on the employee front, as an industry, we got to continue to focus on. Because the answer can't be no, we got to find solutions. And hopefully we get legislators and regulators to understand what we're trying to do actually helps employees, and yet we don't want to be an employer of our franchisees' employees. Yeah, I think Shelly wants to jump yeah, in on that. You know, I'm, I'm the general counsel for Dairy Queen, so I my, my team lives in this world. You know, I can't tell you how many times a week we get the question of, can we do this? Can we do that? You know, here's a great idea. Can we provide this opportunity? Can we, can we tell the franchisees to do this? Because we all know that this is the right thing. This is the thing that will help them um, sort of uh, recruit and retain. And, and there's just a lot of fear, right? And so part of what, what we need to do is manage the risk and balance the risk, realistically assess the risk, um, and then sometimes take a little bit of a leap of faith and say, we're going to try to do the right thing. Um, we're going to provide some of these tools. Um, and again, as I said before, it's being a franchisor has always been about educating and providing resources and tools, and, and that's very important in the, in the employment space and in the, the training space. Um, but I totally agree, Brian, that is, it is a, a, an impediment, and it's something that the franchisees today are really um, screaming for. They're, they want help. They want assistance. Um, and franchisors are, are maybe more hesitant than is optimal um, because of the current situation from a legislative and legal perspective. Yeah, and one of the things we've been trying to do at the association in our advocacy is it, it ensure that franchisors have a certain obligation to protect their brand and the employees are on the front lines at the franchise locations of representing that brand. And so it, it's really not about control of the franchisees employees themselves. Um, it's about brand standards and what that business looks like to maintain that integrity and educating policymakers at the federal level that, you know, carving out some safe harbors around, you know, things that brands can and need to do and that franchisees want them to do um, to help support, you know, going into business for yourself but not by yourself is providing that operational support and marketing support. All of that support helps the franchisees be successful. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, government too often has been pushing a different agenda which is really not about supporting or attacking the franchise model on its face. But of course, we know that there are other forces, particularly labor, that have been trying to organize in, in the franchise space and opportunities for uh, labor to hold brands accountable for franchisees' employment matters creates um, more opportunities for litigation and organizing. So. We're sort of caught in this catch-22 in franchising, and I think the more we're educating policymakers, which again is what this whole campaign and this effort is about, not just federal now, but state like California and potentially cities, um, is, is, a, is a real challenge. Um, but why you know, engagement and, to Brian, to your point, bringing the community together and franchising you know, in markets is particularly important. Um, given the uh, the era that we're in. So um, great comments. Thank you, Shelley and, and Brian, for teeing that up. Yeah, and I think to continue on some of the, the education that policymakers need, you know, one of the goals of the Open for Opportunity you know, project is to highlight real-life franchisees and franchisors, like those in this room. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about franchising, stigma, right? I mean, uh, around certain brands even. So what are some ways, you know, to continue to ensure that potential entrepreneurs, key thought leaders, lawmakers all understand the central role franchising plays, and how do we get more people in the fold? Who wants to take that one? Sorry, I didn't direct it to anyone. Dustin, I think, I think Dustin's you're, you're next, you know, I think. ready to ready to say something. <laughs> <laughs> I can. Uh, thank you for letting me participate. Um, I was a last second fill for my partner who couldn't be here today, and this is his bread and butter. So if anyone asks, I did amazing today. Make sure you share that message. <laughs> He, he will be very disappointed. Um, I think with everything that's been said today and the information going around, I think the best way to tie it together with myself is to talk about quickly my story. Um, I started with Jimmy John's in 1999 and I was wrapping up my degree and I need a little bit of income to pay rent and get a, be get a better car. 
and uh, figure out what I was going to do. And being a delivery driver for Jimmy John's was a perfect fit. So I started and the franchisee that I worked for was one of the first franchisees with Jimmy John's. And he had stores scattered throughout the Midwest and he needed help in all of these locations. He did not have an area regional type person. So I had nothing holding me down in Iowa and I jumped in my car and I started going location to location and, and that job entailed going in and doing the basic stuff like actually cleaning the stores. And, um, but it also had a lot to do with developing the people that were in there, staffing the stores, um, improving the operations. And while doing that store by store, state by state, I really was able, I was able to meet a lot of incredible people that were in the stores and had not been presented that opportunity to lead that specific business. And so practicing that and teaching these people to be leaders and business operators through that process realized I should be doing this on my own. I should be a franchisee and I have an opportunity to, to do so. So, uh, a partner and I at that time, who's now my wife, we moved to Kansas City and opened to Jimmy John's and we operated those stores for eight years, eventually selling to a local franchisee, moved back to the Twin Cities where my wife was from. And I jumped on board with uh, Dan Van Steenberg, my partner who's not here today at uh, Spin the Planet. And we at the time were 20 some Jimmy John's locations in the cities. Today we're at 45. and as we grew, I, I took what I had learned in the very beginning and applied that to spin the planet store by store, manager by manager. And instead of going in and focusing on just do your job, hit, hit your food goal, hit your labor goal, it was going in and helping them, uh, giving them the power and the knowledge to be business operators, to be owners. And doing that store by store turned into area by area, which turned into president and, and co-owner and all the entire process using the knowledge and the power to give people in the stores the, the opportunity to own and operate their own businesses. And we have had numerous either purchase Jimmy John's as a franchisee. Um, we have helped fund in, it, managers that don't have the ability to go to a bank and get a loan. Um, we've actually funded them personally to help them get started, to get their feet on the ground and start their business. Um, our corporate team everywhere outside of the store, I think all of our employees minus one have come from a Jimmy John's location, whether they were managers, drivers, operators. Um, and one thing that we've done throughout that process to help them become owners, operators of their business is every 28 days, we share 25% of our profit with those members. And that allows them to put, put funding away and think about how do I take this? How do I save this? If we can convince them to be smart with that money, to save that money and use that to start their own thing down the road. I just, I think that's been a, a very powerful tool over my years and it's been very successful. And I think it, it helps tie everything that I've heard in here today. Yeah, I think anytime there's a powerful human element, like a, a very powerful story, like human story to, to any of these businesses, that's that's what really removes that stigma and, and sort of like just shows people like, oh yeah, this is a business like any other, so let's let's get in on it. Um, I kind of want to follow up on that sort of talent pipeline and getting people up from stores. This kind of seems to be like a, a, a story here, a theme that you know, we're getting a lot of folks in uh, who just start at an entry level job and end up you know in your positions in some cases. How can we? Um, how can you? How can anyone? help develop that talent pipeline, make sure opportunities are widely spread um, and that folks are getting the chance um, to either become entrepreneurs or just get where they want to get through these organizations. Does that make sense? And that's for anyone who maybe hasn't spoken yet or who wants to, who has an ex experience, um, experience with this. So I think that's really what we're here to do with Open for Opportunity, right? We look at franchise owners, local community-based business owners, um, that, that really have invested in their neighborhoods, right? We put young people to work. We give folks that are looking for a new job, a new career path, maybe a change um, coming back into the workforce as a senior, everything in between. That's what our community-based franchise owners do. But it does take some partnership, I think, with our community leaders, our organizations like Meta 
and some of the others that are represented here that really I think if we keep this conversation going, we could look at how do we build a pipeline but sustain it with the right goals, right? Not just putting people to work, but giving them real incentives to become business owners. And franchising is, by and large, the single best way, I think. I think uh, our research has proven that it is the most sustainable, most um, uh, financially uh, uh, important way that a, an entrepreneur can get started and I think it's backed up in all of the statistics, but I would go one step beyond. And I would say that it's satisfying. It's the gratification of putting people to work and giving them the chance to go on to create their own dream in their own main street, wherever that is. There's, there's nothing like that. Giving people that chance is our responsibility, I think, as business leaders, community leaders, and all of our franchising partners in the room. I think it just takes the will to get everybody in the room on a regular basis and figure out where those connection points are. And I, I'm excited to see so many people interested in having that conversation. Yeah, it really is the essence of Open for Opportunity. I mean, so many of our brands, uh, like I said earlier, they um, one of their biggest challenges is just qualified leads to become prospective franchisees. And yet, you know, Dustin, you touched on this. Um, employees don't fully understand or appreciate that that is sort of in the cards. Um, and, you know, other um, underserved communities don't know because of perceptions that these are big companies and I could never be, you know, the owner of a restaurant or a hotel or a retail facing business. Um, and so Open for Opportunity is all about, you know, you can't be it unless you can see it and telling that story, not just through, you know, small communities like this. It's one of the reasons we're live streaming this round table and putting it out on our LinkedIn and our other social media platforms. I mean, there are people watching this who could become franchise owners and reaching out to the IFA or to our brands directly um, is part of what we're trying to do as an organization. Um, and then on our website, on our Open for Opportunity website, you know, there are dozens and we'd like hundreds of uh, testimonials and videos telling these powerful stories that match up with uh, the Open for Opportunity campaign. And franchising, it's not any guarantee of success. Um, you know, it, it, it requires grit. It requires capital. It requires finding the right franchisor. Not all franchisors are created equal. And Brian touched on some of that. Um, but when it works, it's an incredibly powerful opportunity. So that is what um, this is all about. Yeah, Dorothy. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree um, with what I've seen um, in especially BIPOC communities in terms of entrepreneurship. But the one small data point that I keep getting back to is, and it's related to the stigma uh, about franchising, is um, there is messaging uh, that certain franchises are unhealthy for specific communities because of health-related issues. And so how do you really get behind that and tackle that? You know, it's Taco John's and the Wendy's and the McDonald's and, and all of these things. So I don't know how you get to that. Uh, but what I do know is that community can get behind mission-driven activity. And what I mean by that is we sometimes put business here and then mission over here, as if businesses shouldn't have a mission. And I don't agree with that. And so is there a way that the mission-driven focus can be elevated for franchises? Uh, I'm reminded of one of the franchises, national franchises, or even global for that matter, uh, coming out with um, a commercial about who their owners are and connecting with their owners. And it had nothing to do with selling their product. It was about the people. And so more franchises being able to be that visible or even more visible how, and being very culturally specific because uh, I, the soundbite in the black community is vastly different than the Latino community, than other communities of color. And so getting to the heart of those messaging that would resonate with these communities, I think is worth the money put into it in order to start changing the stigma. You're not going to be able to do that from a, uh, just a materialistic kind of way, but it's connecting to that mission of that franchise organization. I want to add to that. Um, you talked about, Matt, you talked about 
having the having had to have the vision and um, both of our organizations work with entrepreneurs who have a vision for owning a business to be successful um, is there a pathway for those folks who have the vision but may not quite have the means uh, is there is there a way that um, people who have the ability uh, can get into this get a franchise or get started so that someday that they can own a franchise without it being as harmful to them, to them financially as trying to start their own business without the support that you all provide? Yeah, I mean, there are a number of uh, platforms and programs that are brands um, and that the IFA Diversity Institute has uh, worked with partner organizations um, to develop um, in terms of offsetting some of those financial hurdles. Um, so that is that is truly the mission um, of the Diversity Institute uh, is is matchmaking um, those individuals that have um, the vision or the interest and desire with the right opportunity um, that exists. And if if financial assistance is something uh, that is necessary, uh, there are some funds uh, out there available uh, to do that. We also work closely with the Small Business Administration. Um, they have some programs uh, as well. Um, we also are um, working uh, with uh, a potential grant um, from uh, some federal um, organizations, uh, specifically focused, like MBDA, um, specifically focused on uh, offsetting some of those financial challenges for uh, minority uh, entrepreneurs. Um, but we're wide open to other uh, partnerships. And, and like I said, there's a strong desire by our, our member brands uh, across you know all of the sectors, um, not just you know food service and hospitality, uh, to diversify. But again, you always want to make sure that you know you match with the right person and the right brand, because um, there's nothing worse than you know when it goes wrong. Judy, go ahead. Yeah, I want to add to that. So I work for a Community Reinvestment Fund, which has worked for franchises for over 30 years. We're an SBA, 7A lender. We also do um, other loans. So to add to your question, we're actually have been working with um, one of the largest banks in the nation, working with one of the largest franchisers in the nation who want to be intentional about who are their franchise owners, franchisees. Um, and they are working to diversify their franchisee network and in intentional ways in terms of the financing when there's credit gaps, when there's um, equity gaps and those types of things. And so they're working with CDF CDFIs like MEDA, like CRF, this whole community of CDFIs that want to provide you know, gap financing or other types of financing that's not the conventional way to own a franchisees in the um, capital space, but also wants to be more... Um, you know, looking to diversify who those franchisees are. So we've got some, um, you know, conversations and work to be done, but there's the, this idea that that can fill that capital need in terms of either gap or when there's credit issues and that sort of thing. So I think putting in that CDFI um, player in these partnerships is also a really, probably a good, good idea. And I'll just add one last layer to that, and that's mentorship. When we talk about that first year, that first three to five years, the franchising community is the very best at helping each other begin and continue. And I think IFA does a terrific job putting the right people together, formally and informally, with mentorship programs. And we talk about the Twin Cities, and I am from the Twin Cities. I, I get calls from fellow franchisees from any different kinds of brand or people that are just considering going into business and, and might have a business a couple doors down from one of mine. And I'm always happy to take those calls. And I think that's another way that we can build some connections because that mentorship piece that is very specific to franchising can go a long way towards the success rate that really is important to me when we talk about mission. You know, I'm, I'm a franchisee, not a brand. My mission has always been to put people to work, always. Give people an opportunity to learn something wherever they're at in their life. And so I think that's one of the ways that everybody in this room and as we take the conversation forward, we can talk about the mentorship piece of this, how to let other people become business owners and kind of share the franchising, that wealth of knowledge that, that we all know is out there. I think that would be tremendous if we could keep that conversation going. Well, thanks everyone. I think we've got time for one more question, it looks like, and uh, let's, I'm gonna throw this to everyone, especially if you haven't uh, chimed in much yet, uh, please answer this. Um, 
talking about franchise uh, franchisees and the support they get, you know, especially helping uh, during downtimes, which we might be headed into. But there's a lot of just economic uncertainty out there, right? So what what is it? What is the support you get? What can you expect? And, you know, just tell the broader broader audience, right? Like, how is it that you're better able to weather uh, downtimes than maybe uh, other ways of owning a business? Who wants to weigh in on that? Go ahead. I think I'll take this because our president's right over there, so it's a little bit... <laughs> Um, Great Clips Corporate is just one of the best franchisors to work for. Um, my dad's a franchisee for 32 years. I joined the business 11 years ago, and they just provide so much training, support. I can email or call Rob or Steve Hockett whenever I want, and that is very unique. And um, I just can't say enough about you guys and all the support you guys provide us. So thank you. Anyone else have any uh, any? Kind of points to share on that same point that you know you're just uh maybe you've got a little more support than you would if you're out on your own and you know you've got bills to pay i don't know Anyone? well i mean during covid i think there were a lot of great examples of franchisors stepping up um to offset um costs like uh relaxing or waiving royalties for periods of time uh you know, building integrated supply chains is something that we've seen, you know, many franchisors, uh, you know, doing more of. Um, purchasing co-ops uh, is, you know, another area related to the supply chain, but even more broadly that uh, franchisors are investing more and more in. Uh, we're seeing an increasing trend towards, we call it platforming uh, in franchising. Um, Jimmy John's, of course, uh, is part of, uh, part of that with the Inspire brand system. Um, you know, it's really uh, bringing a, a greater level of sophistication to uh, the franchise uh, business model while still maintaining that, uh, that local ownership. Um, it comes with its own set of challenges um, and, you know, shared services and things like that. But when it works, it can be, you know, very powerful uh, in terms of providing, you know, the same type of support across different uh, types of brands. Um, so those are just some of the things and trends that we're seeing uh, in the sector. And I might just add, because I think there's the franchisees relying on their franchisor for that kind of support and guidance. But I think Tam hit on uh, an important point. It's other franchisees in other systems, too, that can exchange ideas and support and mentoring. And so I think that's this franchise community. How can we um, provide mentoring, converse, sometimes it's just conversations. It's facilitating uh, Courtney talking to other franchisees about what they're going through and maybe sharing a best practice that can be enough, right? To get that person, that other franchisee through the next week, the next month. It's, it's the little things that can matter the most. And I think that's the opportunity we have. Yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful thing to be able to have a Rolodex of, you know, dozens or hundreds or even thousands of other people that are owning the exact same business that you're owning in a different community. And if you're thinking about that investment in a franchise, you also can talk to people that have left that system and it hasn't worked out. And that may help you decide that's not the right match. Um, and part of our job at the IFA is to, you know, make prospective franchisees more aware of the information and the disclosures that are required to be out there to make that purchasing decision, you know, a match that will work. And again, it's not always perfect. Um, yeah, Dorothy, please. I, I apologize for speaking so much, but I, you can tell my excitement about <laughs> being the president and CEO of MEDA for the last 90 days. I want to put a plug in for MEDA organization that part of the way we started was to provide technical assistance, and we can't really house all of that expertise, right? So we have to rely on uh, others. And so we have a program called, well, the acronym is VAN, but it's, it stands for Volunteer Accelerator Network, where we're going to corporations, the major global corporations, and it could include franchises, uh, to provide for uh, uh, specific market-focused uh, technical assistance to uh, our uh, BIPOC entrepreneurs, whether they're just starting out or whether they're limping along in the marketing and they can get some, some help. Uh, because we have a focus on franchise, this would be a wonderful opportunity to connect with uh, franchise owners and include them in that Rolodex of ours that we're building. 
across the state of Minnesota but across the nation to provide for that kind of technical assistance to our franchisees. Yeah, we, I think we'd have a lot of members that would take you up on that, uh, that offer, so we'll make sure we have that connection. Yeah, and I think that it's really great hearing these sort of empowering stories of these franchisees and franchisors working together. And I think that um, one thing that's also important, talking about the technical aspect that um, some of these great organizations bring in, um, is just realizing the, the role, and it was touched on earlier, that um, this, this sort of regulators and legislators um, can often tend to um, start to complicate this. And in um, an area where we've seen franchisees be very flexible in a very difficult time coming out of the pandemic and um, looking forward to um, a possible recession, um, I think it's really important that franchisees, IFA has done a great job, Minnesota Retailers um, is working on this as well, um, is making sure that the stories of these franchisees are sort of lifted up to show um, that, you know, it's not the the owners versus these workers versus the consumers. It's this ecosystem that works together um, really strongly. And that that's important to know when they're they're considering these regulations because um, frankly, you know, a lot of franchisees um, treat their workers much better than um, some non-franchisees, right? Or so that's that's something that, um, I think should be lifted up and um, is really important for these successful franchises to pass along um, as you're mentoring as well as to be um, active and use your voice to speak to those making decisions on local, state, and federal level um, to make sure that, you know, they know that you guys got it handled. Yeah, I mean, again, th thank you for that comment. And it is what Open for Opportunity is all about is, um, you know, not being defensive. Um, it's we're trying to create the the greatest show on turf if you're a football fan and a St. Louis Rams fan. Um, so that's what this campaign is all about. Offense with data and um, stories and relationships. Um, we will always inevitably have to react to things that government may propose uh, at us, and we will do that. But, you know, we can control how we're, you know, educating, who we're educating, uh, and building relationships before you need them. So... Um, thanks to everybody for participating, Brooks. Thank you so much for uh, moderating uh, a great discussion. Uh, it's great having the mayor here. Um, you know, we'll be working uh, again with city council, state elected officials, our partner organizations, the chamber, the retailers, and and others uh, to continue this efforts. Um, and we have another great conversation uh, tomorrow morning uh, at another uh, at one of our franchisors' uh, self-esteem brands. So looking forward to some of you who are going to join uh, for that roundtable as well. Thanks again, everyone, so much for your participation, for being here this morning. Thank Take you. care. Thank you.